Okay, so I have the privilege to separate you from the drinks, as one says, usually at the end of the, of the evening. So I will try to keep it a bit more informal, even more informal and more interactive. If you like, I invite you actually to interrupt me. Uh, if you have questions, anything that would keep uh, this very generous audience that resisted until now uh, fresh and interested. Um, my name is Gianfranco Cecconi. Uh, I actually work for Capgemini Invent. I, I have the privilege of uh, leading a consortium of companies that work for DG Connect in the European Commission and the Publications Office, uh, running two programs uh, for them. Uh, the first one is the European Data Portal, and the second one, the Support Center for Data Sharing that Dietmar uh, named briefly at the beginning of today. Um, today I will talk mostly about the first uh, project in the context of, of government data, and you will soon understand why. Um, and I like the idea that in the same way we started with the Commission, uh, I like to reconnect with, uh, with this slide. It's something I use very often. Uh, Europe is seen as a third way in technology. Europe is seen as the alternative of the best balance by many between uh, the US on one side, very liberal, but let's say a bit unregulated, and, and China on the other. And extremely powerful, not necessarily matching the kind of values we have in Europe. Uh, by implementing the digital economy, as Dietmar described earlier, in a way we try to put ourselves in that sweet spot where we can, at the same time, uh, uh, work against, work for our values at the same time uh, and unleash the economy we want uh, for Europe. And all of the work that the Commission has been doing uh, in data and in digital is consistent with this view. This is something that at least I do for myself. I want to reconnect to that when I work on, on our projects. And the work that has been done is vast. So it's specifically for what concerns uh, my projects, uh, I, I'm in that kind, in that part of the universe over there. And we are progressively moving down to data sharing, but the work the Commission has been done is enormous, uh, going from, of course, the GDPR we named earlier, everything that is related to personal data, uh, to what a few years ago was simply called PSI, uh, to the free flow on personal data that is coming soon for homogenizing regulation around data centers across Europe. That Sounds boring, but it's quite important as well, because you won't need to wonder where exactly your data is stored as long as you are in the European Union. There won't be detail you need to care about. And so many expert groups across Europe working on uh, blockchain. Oh, no, I said the B word, sorry. Uh, but that's real. There's, a, there's an expert group on blockchain. Uh, people working in ethics, people working in information policy. All of this very often backed by very specific initiative by the member states. I was in um, Finland, the current presidency of the Commission, a few uh, months ago, and they were uh, proposing starting an entire ministry for information policy. So these themes are becoming mainstream for most of the member states today. Specifically to open data, um, we have history. So. We have three different directives in time. I'm not going to, to make it boring, talk about legislative uh, foundation of the work the Commission does, but it is interesting to see how all of this started very, very early, back in 2003. And it is with the latest uh, Open Data and Public Sector Information Directive from 2019 that actually we start talking about API. And that is where the link with the event today is and, and the API days work. And the directive is extremely explicit. Uh, Recital 31, dynamic data should therefore be made available immediately after collection. That's quite straight, right? It's not leaving much ambiguity there. The, the imagine being a civil servant reading this thing and say, oh my god, no, now I need to do it for real. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, personally, uh, in my background before this project as an activist, when I read this, I said, oh my god, oh. We have arrived, okay, this is fine. This is really finally happening now. And this directive has until July 2021 to be implemented. So we, we are close. Again, well-designed APIs, of course, this is just a piece of text in a piece of law, but it's a recommendation, it's strong, it's intended, uh, supported by documentation, um, recognized standard protocols. Uh, availability, stability, maintenance of the life cycle, uniformity, all of those principles are captured in a piece of law by the European Union today. So we're not joking, we're not fiddling around here. And finally, the point about the high-value data sets that was made by Dietmar. 
this, again, is not a joke. Some of that open data will be recognized so instrumental to the digital economy that will have to be provided by APIs by law. This is not a recital, this is an article. You can be sued if you don't do that. Every citizen, I I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the legal people among you, uh, every citizen can sue their country if they, the law of the country does not comply with a directive from the European Union. So prepare <laughs> your, your lawyer's friends to, if you don't get through APIs and data sets you're interested in, that is a high value one. So these are the roots of the projects uh, my consortium runs. So the European uh, Data Portal started almost five years ago uh, to um, be a directory of open data available by the member states uh, for the public. Uh, there is, this thing is old, oddly enough. In, in the kind of uh, uh, digital world we live in, a website that is five years old looks like it's been there forever. Uh, the idea was to provide that kind of infrastructure that is necessary for people to find this data. Even before even talking about API, this is bef well before API started being discussed in the directive, uh, DigiConnect at the time realized that there was a need for this data to be found. And a point that came out earlier today as well. Um, at the time, the solution was to create a network of contributors across Europe uh, something that I would call a, a star-shaped hierarchy by which every city submitted their data to every region, which submitted their data to every uh, country, which submitted data back to us. So you have a kind of model in which all the metadata describing all data sets from any place in Europe, as long as it is open data, bubbles up and you can find it here. The work is beyond simply offering um, the data itself. We were asked, and we still today, take care of the entire, um, uh, let's say, value chain by which open data is produced. From the moment it is collected, the moment it is published, made discoverable from the website itself, made accessible, the API, so simply download for the more traditional among us, um, and the more, let's say, Eldorado part of this, that is, uh, getting actually data to be used for real in real applications and measuring impact. That is a bit of a the challenge for everybody who is in open data today. Um, and this is not the subject of the conversation today, but if you invite me again, perhaps we will have time for that as well. Um, publishing is where perhaps in the early days we were more active. The countries back in, say, four years ago, for them it was already a challenge to get the data out and not even as APIs, in the simplest way possible. Uh, scraping down the barrel of, of, of data storage hidden somewhere, getting the data out. Uh, DigiConnect asked us to help them through uh, terror support, organizing events, workshops for them. We still meet them regularly. Uh, it, one of the best pieces of my project, one of the things that make me happier is actually having the opportunity to meet the countries to discuss these subjects every few months. Um, and uh, particularly in terms of standard, promoting something called DCAT AP that many of you, I guess, must know, that is a standard to describe catalogs of data sets. Um, Europe is promoting this heavily. Uh, there will be revision to these standards. Catalogs in particular, not the individual data sets, must be described according to this standard um, at some point. It's not yet law, but this is what Europe is trying to push for. Uh, and as part of this work, we also benchmark how the member states are performing. Uh, it, it may sound perhaps a bit of a, a theoretical exercise, but we realize over time that actually the countries like to be measured in a way or, or benchmarked against each other. Uh, every year we run this exercise. It is currently uh, uh, being executed at the moment uh, back in my office in Utrecht, uh, where we uh, collect the results through a series of questionnaires that we give to the member states and we try to make sense out of it and describe it back to them. Uh, the report that comes out of this exercise called the Open Data Maturity Report comes out every year around uh, early November. And uh, today is used actually by the member states uh, to find um, 
way of doing things differently, check what the other countries are doing, uh, uh, solving problems that perhaps others have been dealing with, say, last year or the year before. Um, oh, not the young thing. Okay. Um, and also, it's become a tool for policy. So if you realize your team is short of budget, just go and, and demonstrate how the others are doing, how many people perhaps are working in another open data team in your neighboring country, and make the point uh, to your legislator. The discoverability part is probably the reason why the project is called Portal in the first place. So uh, that was perhaps the original concept for the project as, an, as a whole. How, where do you go when you want to search for data sets across all of Europe? And what we do is simply propagating metadata from, uh, say, uh, the European institutions like Eurostat, uh, from the actual member states, uh, all popping up uh, to, to us. And you see on at the bottom in particular, there's one of our main uh, um, contributors that is the European Union Open Data Portal, aptly named, almost identical to us, that is the portal that publishes open data from European institutions as well. So when everything goes well, when our contributors are effective, when the metadata is good quality, a lot of if I realize that, uh, you come to us and you find the data sets you need across all of Europe. Uh, thanks to another of the building blocks provided by the Commission, we also have metadata translation. So you, in that box there, when you search, you can search in your own language and find data about that thing in every other language in Europe. And I don't think any other uh, organization is offering you anything like that. And you have these thanks to you as a taxpayer. Uh, only Google uh, Data Search, it was launched last summer, does something similar, but not in a way that is so structured like this, where the metadata is actually translated uh, behind the curtains. And talking about APIs, uh, you can also query the metadata directly, if you prefer. This is the interactive interface by which you can run uh, Sparkle queries on the metadata we store, but you can use the same in a more pro programmatic way if you want to. So again, for the discoverability or for identifying new data sets that may pop up anytime across all of Europe, that is what you would probably use as a developer today. On the access side, that is where we are pushing for APIs for the member states as well. Uh, so far, because um, the directive was not that explicit, our, let's say, contribution was a bit of a soft push. And now that we have the strength of the directive uh, behind us, we can be a bit more assertive. Uh, so, for example, the benchmarking I told you about earlier will very likely introduce points if you use APIs rather than simply bulk downloads. Of course, not necessarily always, but when it makes sense, when data is dynamic, when data is updated often, when data is so large you wouldn't want to download it every time. We, we are reasonable, right? Um, on use and reuse, um, that where the complicated part starts is um, we try to engage the public. We collect news related to open data, we document use cases, uh, uh, we engage people on social media, uh, we have a few e-learning modules you can use, they're there, they're free, and they are uh, licensed in the open as well, so you can download them, translate them in your language, redistribute, do whatever you like. Um, and we also uh, organize events and participate to events like this to inform you that this resource is available and is there for you. Oh, sorry. And finally, the impact side. Um, that is the hardest part. Among our partners, there are um, academic institutions like the University of Southampton. We are trying to build models by which we can understand what actual impact is done uh, by the open data on society. Um, the, the chimera of measuring that is possibly one of the hardest uh, parts of the whole thing, particularly because it is open data in our case. There's no way to, uh, to know where it goes, uh, unless um, the reusers voluntarily document the use of open data. Something we do, uh, we will do this year in particular, is running a study we, we simply call, for short, the economic report, in which we run another large survey across companies this time, not governments, to document the use of open data in their business model and in their production systems. Um, the results will be out early next year. I'm sorry, I'm giving you so many teasers. 
Um, but I guess you'll have to meet again uh, in a few months from now. Now, um, again, I'm, I'm being very fast, but it's in your interest, I guess. Um, why are we moving to data sharing? So DJ Connect, uh, about one year ago, I believe, uh, started realizing that progress on open data was, in a way, constant and stable. We could start trying to make our lives a bit more complicated, going to the next level. Can we also help Europe being better at sharing data that is not necessarily open, that cannot be made open because it's confidential for any reason? It may describe people. It may be um, um, uh, describing business elements of, of what you do every day that you don't want your competitors to see. But at the same time, that data is valuable. The data should be used. And again, data sharing is not news. Any company today can already but hire a few lawyers, set down the terms of a contract, and share between them. At the same time, though, over the last few years, there were, there were so many new models by which data can be shared. If I, if I say something like data cooperatives, have you heard of something like that? Private-public partnerships. All of these models are new. There's no reference to these in law. So it, it's like we are all trying for the first time. If, when they exist, they are set up from scratch. Uh, asking, well, creating terms, uh, legal terms, that before simply did not exist. Europe realized uh, that this is, of course, not optimal. Uh, and to support a better and more developed economy that is based on data sharing, something needed to be done. Um, their response was uh, another similar project to the first, but aimed at companies, the um, Support Center for Data Sharing. This is going to be launched uh, next uh, month in uh, Helsinki at the European Big Data Value Forum. But if you go there, you will see a little beta website that we set up uh, in the meantime. Uh, the purpose of the project is to stimulate the data sharing economy. So complementing what governments do publishing open, can we help companies sharing more, sharing better, particularly trying to reduce that friction due to the very high expenses you can imagine if you start from scratch. If you're a startup, just the cost of hiring lawyers to decide how you can best share data may kill your business case in the first case. In the first case. I can't afford that. I cannot even save money in case I'm sued because I'm doing something wrong, because someone is going to sue me uh, because I'm dealing with personal data and I'm sharing that without knowing exactly what I'm doing. What would that picture be like instead if Europe gave you a standard license, for example. So that is what DigiConnect in this case asked us to do, and you will soon find on that website. Uh, the first part is something that talking about open data was not necessary. That is um, how data sharing works in terms of models. How e are companies sharing data? Uh, Europe asked us to collect what we call practice examples, uh, situations from the real world where companies share data between them. Uh, document how that works, and you saw one earlier on this stage before, the, the one between API Agro and the Ministry of Agriculture in France. That is a perfect example of a private-public partnership for in this case. Um, there are dozens of these, and more interestingly, there is no shared taxonomy. When the uh, uh, <laughs> when the European data portal started, uh, open data was already a thing. When we talk about open data, we all agreed around what it was, although there were competing definitions. While here, nobody knows what we're talking about. If I say data partnership, you may have an idea what it works, but you don't actually have any detail. You don't, you, there is no shared agreement. That is part of what we need to develop for Europe. There is research, and some of it is technology, some of it is legal. So on one side, um, we are going to investigate how to, uh, what technology tools are available for traceability and identification of sources. Uh, there are not that many technologies out there. One is a W3C protocol called PROV, provenance, uh, but it's incredibly complicated to use and actually saw it applied only once. So how does that um, landscape look like today? Because the more we use APIs, the more we distribute data, the more promiscuous, in a way, this kind of ecosystem becomes, the bigger becomes the problem of monitoring where you're getting the data from, who touched it, if anybody interfered with it, and if you're using actually what you were 
intended to use or not. Um, today, perhaps we don't perceive that problem because we are <laughs> well behind that kind of maturity, but it's coming. And being aware of European legislation is an integral part of all of this process. If we don't know what um, our own countries enables to do in data sharing, if we don't know what Europe enables us to do, um, we, we are really navigating uh, unknown waters here. And at the moment, every company moving in this space is dealing with this kind of problem, which means that um, what Europe asked us to develop, that is a reference modular license for data sharing, will at least uh, um, lighten this kind of trouble. Um, so in three years from now, you will have um, a European blessed license to enable you to do data sharing without starting from scratch. This will not take your lawyers uh, off uh, their job. At the same time, they will be able to focus only on the important parts, the customization, the detail, while you will have the opportunity to start from something that is standard and is recognized by the Commission. And technical guidance. So five years after the European Data Portal, today we cannot talk about technology for data sharing without talking about APIs. Um, of the work that the Commission asked us to do, uh, there is a substantial component of uh, writing guidance, documentation and training uh, related to the use of APIs. Uh, there may be some overlap <laughs> with the other project we discussed today, but in a way it's good. It means that there is a tension co coming up and we, n we can coordinate ourselves. We literally had a call with Laurentino uh, a few days ago specifically to bring together all of this effort. And security, some of us named it earlier today, is becoming another large uh, issue. Um, and also uh, the Commission asked us to document that. Finally, uh, and more interesting perhaps, um, I don't know what your experience of European Commission website is. Usually they're very formal, right? Very, very cold. Uh, we persuaded the Commission this time to have a forum on this. So when we launch in October, you will be able to come to the website and actually offer your own experience. Uh, one of the key principles of Support Center for Data Sharing when, when the project was designed was that we cannot think we are at the top of an ivory tower and we know everything already. The, it's completely the other way around. Uh, DG Connect is, wants to listen to you th through this project and they accepted this principle. There will be channels on the website by which you can interact with us, make questions, offer your own experience, um, uh, discuss with other practitioners like you and find uh, potentially a solution uh, between uh, the practitioners, between you. Um, and all of this will be collected, disseminated, and returned back to the community. So um, it's, it's a bit of a different kind of approach from what we have the European Data Portal. The first is a sort of a piece of infrastructure. It, nonetheless, it is actually considered a, um, one of the self building blocks uh, Dietmar discussed earlier. But this is one more of a community for data sharing, including uh, the kind of subject that are dear uh, to this community here in this room, but at the same time extending to all of the collaterals that are not in any way secondary. You may have the perfect APIs, but if you're breaking the law, there's not much to do about it, right? Um, so this was all uh, for me. I'm very happy to, to answer your question. Uh, mm -hmm. Wish me good luck with the new project. We will need uh, a lot of um, support and effort to make it work. But again, like for European Data Portal, support data sharing, these are resources for you. Um, use us and please contribute to our work. This is everything for me. Thank you very much, Gianfranco. <laughs> Amazing project. Uh, thanks a lot. Now, in three minutes, the last keynote is uh, starting in the in the auditorium before the drinks. Uh, I'm not sure whether we have time for very one quick question, very quick. And then we rush upstairs. You spoke about licensees. How are you going to interact for writing these licensees with the open licensees existing and the open licensing uh, bodies that already provides licenses? 
we, we are aware we, we are building on, on, we are standing on the shoulders of giants, right? So one of the first uh, output of the project that is already actually in my pocket is a review of pre-existing licenses for data sharing that are already out there. Um, and oddly enough, many players are already active at that. To name um, a company, Microsoft, has been publishing three licenses they are proposing to the community for data sharing. It's quite interesting have seen private companies realize that there is so much market to be developed that they move in a space that typically is more of policymakers. Um, so this document will be available and published in iterations over the, the next three years. The first edition will probably be out in the next couple of weeks or at launch in October, and it is a review of the existing ones. The European license, the one that is the output of longer time, will probably be a sort of a um, combination between um, the best components, the best elements we have observed of the pre-existing ones, and merging in a way with the kind of trend in policy making that we see from the Commission. Um, it won't be final, it won't be a 1.0 that we are going to use for the next 10 years, but it's a step. My personal expectation, I'm talking for not talking for the Commission at all here, is that at some point perhaps a future directive uh, will also cater for data sharing and perhaps will recommend strongly in law the use of that license, but there are a few years to go before we get there. Okay, can I, can I make just, yeah, please, an applause to Gianfranco. Thanks a lot for the great presentation.